Thank you, Craig. Good morning, everybody. Welcome from wherever you're joining us. As we've said already today, feel free to use the chat to engage with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I won't watch it that much as we move through the hour, but Craig has his eyes on it continually. If you have questions, there's a Q&A button at the bottom on your Zoom toolbar. You can pop any questions into there. We'll do our best to answer them. We're also really comfortable with I don't know, but we'll find out for you and we'll let you know as well. As Craig said, we do like to start these by acknowledging that SEAT, when we're at SEAT on campus, and Craig and I are both, both based here in Calgary, is situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today, um, it, in Calgary, it's an area that's known as McIntess which means the elbow, the meeting place of two great rivers. It is the traditional land of the Blackfoot people shared by the Beaver people of the Sutina and the Nakota people of the Stony Nation. It's a place where we all walk in the footprints of the Métis people. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, and so as folks continue to come in, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Craig Hess, uh, the Director of Corporate Training here at SAFE. I work with a fantastic team who's responsible for uh, working with organizations to help upskill and reskill your employees. Um, we've got lots of great content to pull from and lots of fantastic facilitators like Jenny. Uh, Jenny is uh, one of our um, leadership experts and has been uh, with SAFE for some time and we're very happy to be able to have somebody of her caliber working with us. So um, we're gonna have an interesting conversation today around engagement. Uh, Jenny uh, uh, just about scared me beforehand, thinking she was just going to drop off and say, I'm not engaged today. You're on your own, Craig. Um, but um, Jenny, uh, maybe you want to chat to your slide here just to set the stage, and then we can get into some of the things we know about uh, engagement, why it's important, and then get on to the conversation. Absolutely. So what you see on your slide, one of our favorites, Craig, I know you follow them a little bit as well, corporate rebels. And <clears throat> since day one, they've been about making work fun, which puts the hairs up on a lot of people, the back of people's necks, because we immediately go to ping pong tables, parties, um, that kind of, have I got my best friends at work? There you go, I got it in already. And when we talk about um, work being fun, what we need to remember is it's not that. It's not about dressing up as a squirrel and running around in a party. What it is about though, is can we enjoy our work to the extent that we look forward to it as much as when we look forward to going home. And so the other piece for us to recognize too, is we spend a ton of time at work. I like this one because we've been through, been through, we're still going through the pandemic and Netflix has become a number one activity for a lot of people. So, mm -hmm. but we spend more time at work as well. Yeah. There you go. And you know what, you touched on something huge there too. In the past year, we've probably spent far more time at work than we ever have because work has come home with us. It's all blended, right? Um, yeah. But some interesting data from uh, ADP. Uh, we know that despite the billions of dollars that have gone into employee engagement over the past number of years, there's only been a 1% increase in fully engaged employees since 2018. And so that, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure about the return on investment there. Uh, and it'd be interesting to find out why. I think it's going to be even more fascinating to see as we come through this last period, what that engagement is going to look like, right? We can touch on or maybe allude to, you know, there's lots of interesting commentary out there now about the uh, impending or the coming resignation wave uh, as folks have, you know, perhaps realized their, um, their passions and trying to align or not align with work, um, you know, but when you do invest and you do get in, engaged employees, they're highly, there's, they're more likely, uh, 14 times more likely to um, uh, be fully engaged if they have a leader that you can trust. And we've chatted about this in, in prior sessions, right? So much of this, uh, you know, you bring in great psychological safety at work, um, you know, you really do get better engagement your employees trust their leaders, you're gonna see better results in that. Um, Cora, that is a great question. I'll have to find out for you. How does ADP measure engaged employees? Um, I think we can come back to you on that one. So 
Uh, and here, this one very much um, applies, right? If you started or taken on a new role during the pandemic, 42% less likely to be fully engaged. In. And so I don't, I don't know about, uh, I don't know about you, but I know we've brought on new team members at SAIT. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of our employees have yet to see uh, campus uh, as a result of what we've gone through in the past year. So I don't know, Jenny, if you want to put any more color or commentary on this. <laughs> There's a scary one, actually, that 1%. So I didn't see the, the question yet, but um, the study by ADP is a global one. And they use 10 questions for engagement, 10 questions for resilience. And we can send you that study. We can include that white paper. But the 1% increase in fully engaged is a global number. Canada's numbers are down. So since 2018, we've actually gone down by a full percent in terms of engagement. Um, the rest, I think you did full full duty to, let's say. But we know that engagement's worthwhile. That's why we put billions into it. And so when we look at engagement, we get a really decent increase on a whole ton of stuff. So when we look at it sort of through the, through the lens of these surveys, we know that engaged performers are better performers, they're more productive. They stay for longer. When I love my job, I'll stay. It doesn't matter if you'll pay me a dollar more down the road, I'll stay here because I like what I'm doing, probably like the people around there too. If I'm engaged, my service to my customers is better. And when you think about the field that I work in, that makes perfect sense. If I love it, we're gonna have a way better time in the classroom, in the Zoom room, wherever it is. If I can't be bothered, yeah, you can have a mediocre time as well. We also know that absenteeism, just in terms of times off. Now, this is difficult with the pandemic because you can be forced into absenteeism really quickly without a choice. But on a regular level, absenteeism goes down. And the other piece that goes down is toxic workers. Now, this is a really interesting one that a lot of people miss because these people cost the company money, a lot of money. And so if we can reduce the numbers of those, we reduce the effect of those kind of people in the team. And that has a knock on piece on performance and productivity as well. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting too, because for me, you know, what is engagement? And this might be something that folks, if you can throw your thoughts in the chat, like what is, what does an engaged workplace look like to you? Or how do you know you're engaged at work? I'd be really curious to get some of that feedback. Um, Christine, interesting comment about, you know, some companies thinking it's more complicated than it is. I, I think we could probably unpack that one a little bit. Um, I don't know for me personally, I've always been fascinated by the fact that we measure it and we survey it and we uh, spend so much time looking at it. I, I've kind of always been in the mind that if I'm not liking where I'm working, I'm going to figure it out and either make it work for me or I'm going to move. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, it, I, I do find this incredibly, um, I don't know if it's, it's part of this culture where everybody gets a participation ribbon now. Uh, but we're going to make sure you're engaged at work. And I don't know, Jenny, if that triggers anything for you. Oh, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> First off, Christine, good morning. I remember our days at SAIT when you were hanging out with us in the classrooms. And, you know, you nail it. Engagement isn't difficult. We do. We make a big thing about it. Look at the money that we spend on. It's very like performance management. We spend billions and don't actually get what we're, we're looking for. Um, Craig, to, to come back to your point, you reminded me of the saying, you know, you're not a tree. So if you, if you don't like it, you don't have to be stuck there. We have that ability. That's one of the joys of being human that we can, there's choice. We can do something about it. Um, mm -hmm. The other piece that I'm sure we're going to sort of lean into a little bit is this idea that when we show up at work, we show up as adults. So we do, we have those choices. I think you said, what can I do? to make it better, like that's got to be step one. How can I design this so that I, I like it more? You know, do you have to love your job? No, but you can make it better. And then once you've looked at you, then you can look the other way as well. And I'm sure we'll, we'll lean there. Um, I'm loving the pieces that are coming up in the chat. I do have yeah. an eye on it. 
uh, that, that really allow people to get engaged and hang on to it. The definition that's on the screen there that I know that we send out to people afterwards, it, it, I like it because it's a good combination in terms of it's about me, it's about the employer, it's about growth for myself, but it's also about growth for the organization. I think when we get that magic recipe combination, then we start to see that engagement lift. Yeah, interesting. And uh, sorry, Deanna, I think you had a great comment here as well. An engaged place is buzzing, people smiling and are happy to see each other. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think that is a big part of it, right? Um, but I guess where I'm going with this, this whole piece around engagement is, have we or have workplaces created this culture or this expectation of the employee base that because we are interested in it and measuring it and surveying it, we're going to do it for you. In other words, Jenny, I'm the employee, I'm here, engage me. Um, yes, in some places. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a really interesting mindset. It's, it's a pretty grim mindset, I think, for us all to be in. It's, it reminds me of, in my old life, I used to be a school teacher in England at a private school. And, and it was, okay, I pay fees for my kids to come to this school, so therefore you're responsible for their education. And we know fully that the child is, the parents are, and the teachers are. Like, it's, it's just a go-to. And it's the same thing here. You show up at work, okay, it's your job to engage me. It, it doesn't, it's not going to work that way because there's so much on us as employees and there's stuff on you as a leader. And so when we get into that relationship between it working together, then we get a, a higher piece. In fact, you can actually look at it as there's four different responsibilities when you look at engagement as that big picture of engagement. And I don't want to lose the fact, you know, if you want to engage your people, then do that, engage your people. But when we look at that big conversation, we'll see if we can make this work. This one makes me laugh this morning. So if we look at the big conversation, there we go. We've got me on the left-hand side there, kind of like me. Um, but my, my mindset is really, really important here. So if I come to work and I have that sort of solutions focus, don't get sort of confused by optimistic. We're not talking sunshine, roses, unicorn sparkles. We're just talking solutions focused. I'm ready to look forward. I'm ready to ask the what if questions. I'm ready to ask the yes and, and how can we? Mm -hmm. um, do I understand my purpose? How do I fit into that big picture? Can I, am I prepared to be independent, give it a go and have a try? And I mean, the rest makes sense to us there. That's my part in it. And then Craig, if you're my leader, you have a responsibility in this piece as well. And we'll talk about conditions later. It is about what we create in the workplace, what people are coming into. And employee experience is becoming as popular and probably is a better term than engagement because it encompasses more. Um, the piece I love in here, and a lot of this comes from Mind Gym, energizing dynamic performance conversations. That's going to be another Friday conversation we can have one of these days, because if so. you have that prescribed conversation, ugh, it's awful. Yeah. But if we're talking every week and we're building on it, then we've got that two way piece going. The rest of the ones in there we've talked about already in the last couple of weeks. And then seat has a role. Like, what's your corporate story? And, and yeah. the pandemic's really shown that up. The companies who've been able to say, yuck, this is dreadful, but here's how we're going to get through. Here's where we're going. Here's what we stand for. We, we pull into that. That gives us purpose. That gives us a reason. And as you alluded to at the beginning too, we're seeing, I think LinkedIn's tagged it as the big shift, but we're seeing people who have woken up and said, I don't like this corporate story. I'm going to change what I do. And that's probably okay, presuming they've made it on a whole lot of other decisions as well. And then the team's important. And so, you know, we do we have to be best friends? Absolutely not. But we do need to get along and we do need to have inclusion. It's it's all part of that sort of total experience. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the the Gallup, <clears throat> I think it was Gallup with their Q10, right? Do you yeah. have a best friend at work? Boy, did that one create some interesting conversation in workplaces. It, you know, the cynic in me suggests that Gallup has a vested interest in having engagement surveys 
continue to show low engagement because otherwise how would they continue to uh, sell their wares, right? Um, but you know, the other piece that you touched on there was you know, the, the role of creating that environment where folks can choose to be engaged because mm -hmm. you know, at, at the end of the day, I think it is that piece of choosing whether I'm engaged or not. Um, and you know, I had a manager years ago when I first interviewed for my very first sales manager role, he says, Craig, how are you going to motivate your team? And I was nervous as heck. And I remember just rattling through a number of things. And he looked at me at the end, he says, no, you're wrong, which I thought was not great in an interview. He says, at the end of the day, he says, all you can do is create an environment where hopefully people choose to be motivated. And I thought that was a really interesting conversation, right? Like I can't, at the end of the day, I can't motivate you to do something, Jenny. Hopefully we've got a relationship, we've got the trust and we can have a conversation. And when I ask you to do it, you go, yeah, absolutely. I'll buy in, I'll do it, right? Um, so, you know, the role of the, the manager or the leader in creating that space, I think is, it's a difficult one to get right, especially as we've gone through the past year. And I think when you, you know, for me, you, you know, I talked about this ahead of time is, you know, if as a leader, you're not engaged, yet you're still being asked to create that engaging environment for your team. Boy, what a scenario that is. Yeah, so let's, let's look at that for a second, because I think that's really important. And as we head back, people are returning to the office, some have got months to go, some are back next, next week, two weeks, it's coming. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a really big piece because we're all working at different stress levels, different um, curve ch changes of curve, or changes of curve, curve changes going on. So we're all in change all the time. We're all transitioning. So if you're a leader and you're not feeling engaged, you've got to come this way, first of all. And I'm pretty sure we do have a slide. I'll find it in a second. Um, you got to come this way. So what's going on? So it's really difficult to be engaged if your stress levels are too high. And, and we've, I think we've mentioned this every week now. You've got to look after every single day. Where's that boundary? What time do you turn the computer off at night? Um, you know, what, what are you doing in emotional, intellectual, physical, all those boundaries to look after yourself as well? Those stress levels have got to be in place if you want to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a few people out there, yeah, but a little bit of stress is good. Yes, it is. Absolutely. But too much stress is going to take that piece away. We can't actually think clearly when yeah. the cortisol goes too high. And then the other piece within there here, I'll bring the slide up so people can see it is something that I have quite ceremoniously I'm going to say borrowed from um, a gentleman called Benjamin Zander his TED talk best TED talk in the world if you've not seen it and he talks about rule number six and Craig I know you're going to smile at this because you live by this one but rule number six simply cut a long story short is don't take yourself too seriously so take the job really seriously <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously and so that's a really good piece. Like when, when it's not right, when you're not aligning, when you're not feeling engaged, look this way. What are the battles you're fighting? Are they the ones you want to fight? Are they the worthy ones? Are we getting caught up in whatever tornado is being created around us? And the last one there, surviving or thriving. As I said, a little bit of stress is good. Do you remember the last time you were engaged? What was going on for you the last time you looked forward to your job or you liked it or you had a project that you were involved in and you know we had hours we could dig into that whole motivational piece because I love what even though I wouldn't have gone quite that way in an interview but I like what that uh, leader said to you is you can't motivate other people but there is a theory behind motivation and we do know what causes intrinsic motivation as well yeah yeah no but he he, he was also a great leader and he was the kind of guy that could get away with stopping you mid answer an interview and say no you're wrong just stop so it was it was an interesting experience we've got a couple of questions here so uh delissa uh this connects to the psychological safety conversation too if i don't feel as though my ideas are considered or that my knowledge is trusted i feel disengaged we can come with our contribution that makes us feel engaged how do we manage to how do we manage up to deal with leaders who aren't so emotionally intelligent. This feels like it could be three or four Fridays worth of conversation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember everything in there. First off, 
we will be talking about emotional intelligence at some point over the summer. I do know that because we were talking yeah. about it the other day. Um, okay, so what have we got going on here? Um, if your leader doesn't have the emotional intelligence, we're talking about connection, we're talking about trust. And I forget who you said it asked the question, but yes, it totally ties back to psychological safety. It's a really difficult one. Um, on if you're a leader in here, let's go that way first of all, because that's easier. Then people want to be seen, number one. And, and being seen is really simple. If we're if we're face to face, it's hi Jenny, how are you? And care about like wait, wait for the answer there. If you don't care, don't ask the question. Just say hello. Um, if we're working virtually or hybrid. I think we said this in meetings in week one, people's names are important, allow people to be seen. Then the second piece that people crave is to be heard and understood. And so that ties into this listening piece. And we could spend more than an entire Friday on listening because it's so important. We pretend we're really, really good at it. Thinking of engagement surveys, yes, we're listening to you. And then we get nothing. On a on a one on one, you know, we can have a conversation and and yeah, yes, yeah, and then there's absolutely nothing. So I've been heard, I haven't really been understood, and there's no action. So if you're a leader, that's a really key piece. You want to engage your people, stop and listen, and listen through different channels. Some of us love this, some of us love it, etc. Going the other way, if your leader doesn't have that emotional maturity, that's a harder piece to engage into and it really it's really hard to say if we don't know the context and the situation the the choice in there is do i try and engage them and am i having the right conversation so if you've had the same conversation five times and you're getting nowhere change the conversation tie in somewhere else um i i like in this space start with where they're judged so everybody in the workplace has some form of performance management you're judged on something yeah so just say, Craig, you're judged on numbers. So if I'm talking about letters, yeah, yeah, you'll pay attention to me, but not really. But if I start talking about numbers and that's what you're judged on, now you care a little bit more. Yeah. And so that may engage in that conversation and lift that a little bit. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot to unpack in there. So um, Delissa, if that helped, please just pop us a note in the chat with a yes or no. Uh, another question here from Paula. Uh, saying, what do you know about the notion of fake it till you make it in regards to employee engagement? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I like Amy Cuddy's twist on it, fake it till you become it, more than fake it till you make it. <clears throat> um, and actually, I think it has a place. And, and I think that when we look at how we show up, Okay, so, and, and we could talk about this in discretionary effort. You and I were playing with this before, Han Craig, but yeah. it is impossible for me to show up at 100% every day. And so some days, my background life, done it, and I show up and I'm, eh, I'm just about here. I'm going to put that face on to lift myself to here. That's the fake it piece. Okay, I don't feel like this, but I'm going to have a go and I'm going to engage. And nine times out of 10, and it's easy for me, I'm like, I'm in a classroom, I got people to help me with that piece. I actually end up feeling far more engaged than if I just, Ugh, I don't care, I'm not going to bother. So, you know, sort of putting that, okay, I'm going to step into this as if I am engaged. And then we can go back to Ben Zander here. I love it. How would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you were fully engaged? Well, my body language would change. The way I was interested would change. Play that game. And then, yes, you may end up with that sort of make it piece. Imposter syndrome, another whole big conversation, but often mm -hmm. we can use that to take that step, first step forward, to take that first action. The piece where I pop a little bit of caution in there, you know, that fake it to make it, it only works for so long. And if it's causing you more energy and more distress, trying to be something or someone that you're not, I'm not convinced that that's a really, really good idea. Yeah. If you're going to be there in the long term, it might be the time to start considering the change yeah right and so yeah interesting yeah imposter syndrome i think we can come back to that one on another friday morning because <laughs> yeah. i gotta tell you there's days where you and i've been sitting here i'm going why am i on this call with you but it it's worked well uh so i think we can come back to that one uh 
Adrian, I might need you to expand on this perhaps, but any thoughts on adjustments to leadership style in a unionized environment? So I'm, I'm gonna... um, I have to be careful here. I'm not, <clears throat> not an ex expert in unionized styles. Um, I think it would be a good piece to talk about those conditions that we can create. And the, sure. the place where I can't weigh in is I don't know where those boundary lines sit. So I'm, I'm going to run with that, that rider. Okay. But when we look at um, conditions in the workplace, uh, Mind Gym, again, have found there are six conditions that elevate performance. And the really interesting piece in this comes back to something you were saying earlier, Craig, it's as a leader, it's kind of your job to create those conditions, but it isn't a sole responsibility. So it's, I absolutely have a part in it as well. So again, we've got that kind of relationship going where it's two way. And so those conditions are create challenge, allow growth, um, drive purpose, offer choice, recognition and attention. And I do have them on a slide, but I just have those words. So if you miss those, we'll have them in the slide deck that we send to you afterwards. Okay. But what's really cool about them is when you think about it, if you say, okay, let's say we're in, I'm going to call it a performance preview. You know, I have an allergic reaction to the word performance review. So performance preview, Jenny, what are you going to do this year? What do you want to take on? And so I say, you know, let's, can we try this? This is my idea. And you say, well, that is a big challenge. Are you sure that we can do this? And we have this conversation. You say, okay, well, let's have a go at this challenge. The minute that I take that challenge on and I've got your support, we actually kick in a whole load of those other conditions. I'm going to grow if it's a challenge within there. Because we're having a conversation and you understand it, you are able to pay attention to what's going on. So you can say, hey, Jenny, how's that project going? And I can say, Craig, I need 15, 30 minutes of your time for some mentorship, for some coaching, for some brain bashing yeah. um, going on in there. And then my purpose is realigned again because I came up with this. And if I came up with it, one figures that I probably like it. If not, I love it. And so now my purpose is in there as well. So just by one conversation, we've created a whole number of those conditions and we can now talk and walk through them as we go through the year. And that probably, going back to our earlier slide, gives you a really good in for us to have a dynamic performance conversation rather than a checkbox boring conversation. Yeah, interesting. Dynamic performance conversation. I, I like that. Performance review, you know, we, and this is likely a topic for another Friday too, but at, at the end of the day, we've never really had performance reviews. We've had results reviews, right? <laughs> okay, don't get me started. Let's save that for another Friday. <laughs> Uh, it sounds good. Um, so Adrian, I know you put a couple other comments in there. Maybe if you can in the chat, let us know if we've touched on that enough for you. Uh, if not, we can certainly try and answer some questions perhaps in the follow-up material. Uh, another question here, in an extremely busy environment and everything is a priority, how do you manage to take the time to properly engage with a larger team to truly listen, understand, and action? Yeah. Yes. That's a tough one. It right? is. That, that is a really tough one. I, I'm just going to kind of, sorry, I'm going to give my perspective a little bit and then let yeah. you go because, you know, as a leader of teams, um, you, you have to make it intentional, yes. is, is my belief, right? You have to, um, if it is going to be something that is important and you recognize that you have to do this, um, I'm a huge fan of time blocking my calendar, book it in as an appointment, I, you know, for me, it's just a very simple, practical, tactical approach. Um, you know, Jenny, I don't know if there's more that you want to add to that. But for me, is if, if it's important to you, and you know, you have to do it, you've got to put it in the place that drives everything that we do most days. And that, for me, is my calendar. Right. So I, I don't know other thoughts on that one. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, I'm going to use it. Brilliant. There you go. That's a brilliant take. Um, because and, and we said this in week one, you show up to a whole load of meetings, not you personally, Craig, but you show up to a whole load of meetings that are a complete and utter waste of your time. We, we know that that's a fact in the workplace, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So there's the school girl. It makes sense to block that time for things that are important. Like that's, that's just a really good practice to have. A couple of other pieces that we want to think about here. It's harder 
when that's the company culture. Mm. Um, and so now we're swimming a little bit upstream. But one of the things to con consider is if everybody is busy doing, then their heads are down, they're in that whirlwind and they're caught in it. And when your heads are down and you're in that whirlwind and you're caught in it, everything else has the opportunity to just come past you. So there's actually a healthy component for a team, therefore for engagement, for culture, your team culture, if you like, that's going to be really huge in building your engagement to stop and lift your eyes up. And stop doesn't mean that we have to play a really fun team building game to build engagement. Yep. Stop means we stop and we have a really good conversation about what's going on. What's priority? Because when we're so busy doing what we think is priority and we're not checking in, we could be working on the wrong priorities. How many times do things change in an organization and we don't get, quite get the message all the way through? Now people are working on stuff that's not priority anymore. So, you yeah. know, that individual stop and block time, look at your own sort of setup situation, but also that team stop and block time. And, and I've seen... Yeah. Um, you know, I think I've, I've seen it from your team, actually. You've got this, this point where we recharge. Well, that's, that's phenomenal because as you recharge, that's when you get a chance to breathe. And then you're like, ah, we're not talking about this or we're not doing that and we can come back to it. Yeah. I, and sorry, you just triggered a thought for me that another conversation might here might be uh, how do we purposefully have intentional conversations, right? Because I, I think the, the other side of this too is okay if you think you need to address it all of a sudden all right let's schedule the meeting with the group to have a conversation without preparing them for why we're like you yeah. wanted to talk about it we're going to talk about it right That's versus trying to be intentional and planful and really set the parameters for not necessarily debate but just good discussion as a group on how you want to have that conversation if that makes sense it does. And, and you're tying us back to psychological safety again, because you can't have that conversation unless you've got all those other foundations. Right. Um, so they all kind of weave neatly into each other. Yeah. I can't remember the actual quote, but there was something recently. If, you, if you're busy doing, busy all in those priorities, you're caught in the tornado. And if you solve stuff within the tornado or you start new stuff within the tornado, all you do is start a new mini storm. And you, could, you just got a load of mini storms going on the whole time. So you actually have to get outside of it. And that I think that's the sort of piece here is creating, carving that time to yeah. get outside of it. And it's so interesting because, you know, so busy. It's important work, but um, it feels like everything else can sometimes be more urgent. Right. <laughs> Getting the actual work done feels urgent versus the important. Anyway, it's it's an interesting one. But sorry, I want to come back to the comment that you made earlier about discretionary effort. Oh yeah, because I think right. No, I think it's this is this is a hugely important one because at the end of the day, this is why we would focus on engagement, right? Yeah. We're going to focus on engagement because we want our teams and we want uh, you know our employees at large to give us their best effort every day, right? Yeah. Is that possible? Probably not. You know, you said you can't give a hundred percent every day. You come close. I'm going to say like. <laughs> but that's uh but you know so i know we did have a slide on discretionary effort because this is really this is really the crux for me of why we focus on engagement so uh, maybe i'll let you take this one from here yeah no, it's a really really good point because it's largely misunderstood as well um it goes back to the guy who was interviewing you how are you going to get this from your people so let's let's use the chat for a second. Those of you who are in here and and connected, um, let's take. So Jenny works for you. I work for you. Okay. And there is, as you can see on the graph, there's this amount of effort that I can give you. Now, if and everybody's had this person on their team at one point, you may even have been this person at one point. We have somebody who literally just shows up and does their job. It's not enough to. Uh, be a performance issue like they're, they're not slacking they're just doing their job so as a percentage level how much of their effort do you think they're giving you just pop your answers into the chat how much do you think of their effort they're giving you when they are just your average performer they just do enough so tanya said 70 percent okay julie 75 we've got 20s 50s 60 
50. All right, a lot of hovering around that sort of 45, 50, some of us up there in the yeah. 70. Whoever said 20, and I've lost it now in the chat because it's moving so quickly, was, was close. So 30% is what those people would be giving you on a daily average basis. That's it. Just 30% of their effort. And then you've got that person who is your, they're your go to. Okay. They always nail it. In fact, you often forget to recognize them because they're so busy just taking care of it that you don't actually have that conversation to appreciate them. How many, how much percent do you think that person's giving you? They're always there. <laughs> CJ, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So we've got a lot of people adding. Kathleen's gone up to a hundred and oh, my goodness. All right. 80, <laughs> 75. So we've seen it right up on that topic. Here's the end. This was the interesting piece to me. Even your top performer is only capable of giving you about 70% of their effort on average every day. So there's a really key piece in here before we go any further is that it is impossible for somebody to show up and give 100% every single day. We do it for a little bit and then we see that burnout piece creeping in. So be really careful. We're back to self-care. I think we might have to have something on well-being here at some point. So we've got those two pieces. We've got our average performer at 30. We've got our top performer at 70. And in the middle of those two sits discretionary effort. That's the little bit extra that I will give you. And in that sentence, there's a really key piece. That discretionary effort is decided by only one person. In this case, me. But here's the really interesting piece. What do you think I base that on? And feel free, pop it in the chat. Yeah. yeah, Jason, there are too many external factors to give 100%. But what do I base that discretionary effort on? Leader's effort. Leader's effort in as one. Anybody else willing to offer interest? If I feel respected and valued, you know, based on your own expectations, how connected I am. There's some really good answers coming in here because I know we're held by time on a Friday morning. The answer is I base that discretionary effort on how I feel. It's that simple. It's how I feel. So now we're back to emotional intelligence again. We'll get there another Friday. But if it's based on how I feel, there's a really interesting piece in there for the leader. Because now what's the leader's play in that? Now, it isn't your job to sort of create that fuzzy feeling piece but it might be your job to help me feel good about the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's coaching rather than parenting at work. When you guys yeah, see this slide later, things. you'll see a few buzzwords, the light bulb there. Those are the things that you can do to help discretionary effort. Interestingly enough on the accomplishments, we always go to big wins and celebrating success. Um, there was a study, I'd have to go digging for it, but people rate the difference between a day and a great day actually based on progress that they've made. Progress mm. is an accomplishment. So when we've had on those days, like, yes, I made progress. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and that, you know, that, that can be fascinating too, because that's where a lead, you know, as a leader, you have to be able to take the time to figure out, okay, Jenny, if you're reporting to me, what are you considering progress? Yeah. Versus where I may say, oh, well, no, actually this would have been progress, right? Yeah. And that I think can cause that, that, friction that comes up sometime and you know I think you know the, the you know I've heard a great quote and I can't remember who said it but you know no step is too small if it's a step in the right direction right oh. and so I think that's an interesting piece that kind of ties in into this concept of progress or progress um so you, you you know, fascinating that that discretionary effort piece you know I, it, you know, the, the cynic in me would also say, okay, well, the average there is we're getting about 50% effort then. So do I need to hire double the number of people to get 100%? But I'm just playing with math now. You know, I get um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I just want to bring one point up though, Craig, because I think this is really important and you mentioned it there. This is not about getting a ribbon for just doing your job. Yeah. And it, if we create the conditions, people will do their job. They'll want to do their job. We're, we're talking about that engagement piece. Um, you know, I think we lean, there's, an, there's a tendency for people to let, when are people just going to show up and do their job? Okay, that's kind of the expectation. But the piece that you sort of got clear there was, 
if as my leader, if you're not telling me what the expectation is, I have no idea. I'm just yeah. going to run to what I think the expectation is. Yeah. And depending on who I am or what mood I'm in that day, good luck. <laughs> so you need to tell me. No, it's it's a good point, right? And I think sometimes we forget that, right? Yeah. Your job descriptions are there. You know what your job is. Get it done. Yeah, and, right. let, and let's be honest. Any job description is out of date by the time you start your job. 100%. 100%. So we've got one last question here, just in the interest of time. Maybe we'll, we'll get to Kathleen's uh, question here. I have a team member who comes in early every day, maybe even an hour or so, and also stays late. I tell her this isn't necessary, but she says it's just her way. I'm concerned with her burning out. How do you deal with that? And burnout, the list of topics is growing for us. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm trusting that you're making notes. Uh, talking of which, feel free, pop them in the chat if there's a topic you would love to hear about. Yeah. Kathleen has a really good question and we see that a lot. So I think you're doing the right thing. You're having the conversations. That's the attention, the awareness. Um, you know, we're back to, you can't motivate people. You can't control people either, but you can pay attention and you can um, help them to set those guardrails. And so, and I'm presuming from what I'm, we're hearing here, it's more than one conversation that's happening. If you made it a checkbox conversation, well, I've talked to them about that and they just want to show up and that helps me. We're not really caring for that person. But if it's a constant check-in, and we're, we're sort of watching carefully, then you're you're going to be able to support that person. And if they're not hearing you, you know, we're back to the same thing again, maybe the angle of the conversation needs to change. So if they're, if they're a parent, let's say school, the school kids sports is starting up again. So we have one of our daughters plays field hockey. Those of you who are at Satan see my calendar, you'll see three o'clock twice a week, I'm gone, I'm out of here because I'm gonna go watch her play field hockey. And so if you're the leader and you know they have those family pieces, give them that opportunity, providing it works within the, the company policy, et cetera, yeah. to do that piece. It, sometimes people need permission and, and that's a carry on from goodness knows where in the journey, but it's real. And that's part of the conversation that we can have. Yeah, perfect. Um, so Kathleen, if that helped, pop us a uh, thumbs up or thumbs there you go. Thank you, if that works yeah. as well. So. Um, so Jenny, we kind of closed every week with this whole conversation around one big idea, a couple of applied strategies. We're kind of getting to our time here this morning. This has been, um, it's been an interesting conversation. So let's go there. Our, our big idea, we've already talked about it. Actually, that's a joke today. We've already talked about most of these. Yeah. As a leader, so we're not talking company level here. That's a different conversation. But as a leader, if you want to build engagement, that's all you have to do. Engage your people. Like literally get out there, talk to them, listen to them, show trust. If you need to build trust, okay, that comes before we have it. And, and let your people know how they're valued. Last week, we talked about the power. Thank you. Use it on your people. It's my big idea. Done. Our applied strategies for today, we touched on this a little bit. Um, Steve Ball has a sort of build your own winning environment piece. And what you can do in any situation is set your team up for success. So make sure that everybody's clear on the role. And it's not just about role clarity. You got to accept your role before you can perform in your role. So there's a conversation within there as well. I'm, I'm surprised we didn't get here, Craig, but you know, who's working from their strength base? The statistics in this are as scary as the statistics for engagement. Like we, we don't get that opportunity, which is a travesty because when we work from our strengths, it's easy. We feel good. We do good work. Makes an awful lot of sense. Check in with your mindset, check in with the team's mindset. Really important for those of you who are returning to office or now making an official switch to hybrid or flexible working. And, you know, look at the energy levels. What are you doing to create energy for yourself or within your team? And you alluded to this earlier as well, Craig. This is intentional. It's not just one and done. It's a constant um, piece of work for leaders and then you have one one. meeting and say you're engaged <laughs> you spoke to me just when that dear old school bell went do you want to say that again i said you mean we just can't have one conversation jenny and you're engaged no okay 
Well, maybe, but no, I'm not giving you that in here. <laughs> and then the second one is all about recognition. Again, we didn't really have time to, to sort of lean into this, but recognition is really important. It's not reward, it's recognition. And recognition costs you nothing bar time, the time to write a thank you card, the time to have a conversation, the time to write an email. Recognition solely is probably the strongest thing to build discretionary effort. And this is really worth paying attention to because often the people we don't recognize are our great workers because they're good. They just get on with it. We don't need to pay attention to them as much. And then we fail on that recognition piece. So on the left-hand side, a few reminders as to what your recognition needs to be. One size does not fit all in this bracket. We wanna be consistent. If you have a big team and almost sort of say, have that checklist and just keep a track of who you're recognizing and when. It's a little bit scary when you realize who you're missing out or not offering it to. And then of course, there's three kinds of recognition. So people often say, well, I do recognize my people and I'm not getting anything back. Chances are you're simply being informational which is task related. Jenny, you did a good job on this and then specific piece. That's great, but it's not motivational, it's not developmental. And so we wanna build in all three to lift that engagement. Really what you're doing is lifting that feeling of being valued and that's what incites the engagement. And then our questions that we'll leave you with this week, and these are big questions, um, but it's, you know, it's worth starting the noodle is, are you ensuring that emotional and psychological well-being? We're, as we've said, we'll be talking about emotional intelligence pretty soon here. You know, what are the conditions that you're creating? They'll be on the slide when you get them, check in with those. And then I had to come back. We started with it. We need to finish with it. Have you done anything recently that was fun? We know, especially pandemic, work has become really transactional. And we also know that virtual cocktail hours aren't fun anymore. Well, they might be for some people, but not for lots. So, you know, it's just worth asking the question. And it doesn't all have to be on you. Involve your team in yeah. that last question. What would that look like? 100%. Fantastic. Um, this was a fun conversation. I have to say, I enjoyed it. Yi, I know you posed a question. We will, you know what, we'll get you that answer in the, the follow-up material. Uh, we'll answer that question in the email that I send out. So uh, sorry that we couldn't get to it live. We are back in two weeks. Uh, we're gonna take next Friday off. Uh, enjoy a extra long uh, Canada Day weekend. We'll be back the morning of the virtual stampede parade. So hopefully we're not competing for uh, ratings, uh, but uh, we will be back and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, emotional intelligence the next time. All I right. Believe that's what we landed on, right? Do emotions really belong at work? And I said to Jenny, I was kind of reminded of Tom Hanks in A League of Their Own, where uh, his, his, his famous line was, there's no crying in baseball. Um, so do emotions belong at work? Uh, we're looking forward to that conversation. So have a great weekend. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning and we will see you all soon. Take care. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Have a good weekend.